it is projector hasn't gone to sleep no it's coming mm -hmm. excellent and we have sound and we have picture great and we have a lecture Okay, so there's only this final slide in the, the notes here. Um, so the issue was in the small samples case and in some other statistical methods also, it might be necessary to make a test whether a set of data come from actually a normal distribution. So as I said, there are two ways you can do a formal test of this null hypothesis and we can do this kind of visual examination with a what we call a normal plot and both of these are possible in SPSS so I'll show you a few examples um, trying to find some data here these <coughs> are data that we have seen it's just a data with trips from some delivery company with the duration and the distance of trips and we used to look at the the correlation between these variables but that's not the issue here now we're just checking whether these two variables or these two data sets could possibly be from a normal distribution now these are fairly large data set but that doesn't really matter we just do the same thing anyway so normal test it's in the explore menu which does all of these descriptive things so into descriptive statistics and explore and in this case, we just have two variables here and no groups that we want to examine. <coughs> and then we look at statistics. Well, we, okay, we might want to have these descriptive things. We don't need it exactly now, but let's just have it. And then you click plots. And choose something here. You might don't <coughs> want box plots, but I want a histogram and not a stem and leaf, for instance. But the more important thing is normality plots with tests here. This is something I want. <coughs> so continue and nothing more. Then just wait. Well, okay. I don't know why this takes any time at all. This should be very quick. But uh, anyway, here is the, the 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 typical explore output for the two variables. This is just a bunch of descriptive figures. Not, but the thing I was looking for now is this here. It says test of normality. And I told you, you will get the p-value. You will get two p-values, actually, because there are two different tests. And the p-values are always in the, this one is called kolmogorov Smirnov, um, named after the famous Russian mathematician Kolmogorov, who laid the foundation of much of modern probability theory. 
And here is something called Shapiro Wilk. So there are two different tests. You can look it up in the literature if you like, but you don't have to. Um, and here it says it just says 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.1. And here it says with a star, this is a lower bound on the true significance. So it means the actual p value is at least as large as this, possibly larger. So what this tells me is that P1 is more than 0 0.20 and P2 is at least 0 0.1 and 0 0.15 in one case. In all cases, it's larger than the critical or the magical alpha significance level. So we keep the H0 here. There's no strong indication that these data are not normal, right? Yeah. So slightly informal, we could say something like that. That does seem, it doesn't seem to be a big mistake to say that the data are normal. And then you get the histogram for, say, the duration variable. And if you imagine a normal distribution on top of this, there are ver statistical variations, but it doesn't look horrible to assume some normal distribution. And then what is more interesting, the normal plot. Of course, it takes a bit of training to say that, OK, this looks fairly OK. There are some slightly suspicious turns in the end, but most of this is very nicely on the straight line. And then you check the other var variable, you get exactly similar results. So you get two normal plots there. And this is the case where, where the where this is OK. Now let's look at something else. Um, this uh, demographic data that we looked at in the beginning of the course, here we find a lot of data that are probably not normal. So we, you can look at the uh, life expectancy of females, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. Explore this one and something else, for instance, the GDP per capita. That's quite interesting. Uh, okay, so this thing has gone back to its default, and I don't want that, I want this, and not that, and normal plot test. Yeah. Mm. And now. So all the massive figures here. But the interesting thing again is the test of normality. Now, p-values in both cases are 0 up to 3 decimals, right? So and this is, of course, less than 0.5. So in this case, we reject h0 with a very strong evidence, in a way. Now let's see what happens with the histogram. In the first variable, this is the f female life expectancy. Um, I mean, these data are not sort of the most encouraging to look at. Uh, 
it tells us that the world is not in the shape it should be, but um, it's just some examples that show some interesting statistical properties like this skewness here. So look at the histogram. You see a bunch of countries up here, and then fewer countries stretching out down here. So that means this data is what we call skewed in one direction. And how does the, the normal plot look? Yeah, you get this strange and very systematic turns away from the straight line. So this is very, very much corresponding to this finding here. Second variable was the um, GDP per capita. And you plot this on the on the in the histogram. You get the, the opposite picture. This is skewed, but on the left side it has more number of countries down here, and then fewer up in the, the high level. So you see the normal plot again. It is very different from a straight line. Yeah. Good. So let's see. Why is this coming all the time? It's not the one I want. There. Yeah. So, um, then we know about this. We know how to check uh, this question based on looking at the data. And this is quite, I mean, this is very often something we will need to do actually in, in practical statistics. Okay. And now I'm going to make a little choice, which is to. Uh -huh. I did this note last year, uh, more or less as a sort of intermezzo in between all the details and stuff, and trying to put um, some of the hypothesis testing and so on into. Um, a more general setting, um, but I don't think I will spend the time this year to go through it. We are a bit, little bit after the program, so you can just read it. I think it's uh, there was an example about vendor managed inventory. Those of you who deal with logistics will at least learn about it soon. It's a very nice thing, but. It's not exactly statistics, so I don't think I will take the time to talk about it. So I suggest you look through this. If you have questions to it, um, ask me. But there's nothing really here that is going to be on an exam or so. So, so it's more like or orientation <coughs> material. And the choice that I make instead of this is to start carefully with our next chapter, which is um, the rest of the semester, actually. And this is going to happen today on a very um, overview level. So we're going to do all the details starting from next week. And you might not even need to write anything. I guess today. But you can do as you like. I mean. Let me 
means we are into chapter, it says lecture four, I would say chapter four. Um, starting a regression analysis. And I call it an aerial view. That means like a bird we're flying above and looking at the big lines, not the details. So this regression analysis is mainly the primary or the, the tool that we use in, in statistics and actually all of science to analyze what we call a relationship. Um, this is, if you start thinking about it, like any, almost any science is a lot about relationships between variables. Um, like economics, like logistics, efficiency, like uh, medicine, like almost whatever, a very huge uh, part of science is to try to understand how different variables are acting together. Uh, and the primary tool is actually regression analysis to, to study such such uh, relationships. And importantly, these variables, they are very often have to be modeled as random variables. So just to take one fairly trivial example, but which we could call economics. Um, you could say that why is the price of a used car, say in the Norwegian market, then why uh, for a given car is a random variable, but it has a strong dependency on certain other variables, right? So, Anyone who has ever thought about bu buying a car would know that the age of the car is important. The mileage, that is the number of kilometers it's been driven. Uh, the price when this car was new is of course a highly important factor determining the price as a used car and so on. So what we need to do is to model, we, we talk about models here, and actually in this case it would have been a benefit to have gone through the previous note actually, because then uh, there I talk a bit about models, but we make models which are simple. representations of reality. So what I say in the, the, the model note before there is that all human knowledge is actually in terms of models. We cannot understand the world in any way other than fairly simple representations of reality. So therefore I say in the previous note, now I'm always almost going back to the previous note, so I should have started there, but um, there are approximations. So they are not the true reality. So that's why I say
just just to remember this because this is quite nice. Uh, as a sort of an aside, in science we, we deal exclusively with models. And people who do too much science, they start to live inside the models and forget about their simple representations of reality and their approximations. And somehow they are all false, right? So the art of science is, in a way, to have models that are simple but still sufficiently uh, realistic to, to answer the questions that we, that we want to deal with. Okay. So actually all that you will be hearing about in the rest of this master program will be somehow related to models and it's sometimes useful to just have this in the back of your mind. Uh, this is the model and this is the real world. It's not the same thing, but hopefully there is good connection. But not always. Uh, right. So that's a uh, slight aside. But as I said we have to model the dependency. And in this case, we are talking about something like a mathematical model. So we put down some uh, well, how do you model dependencies in mathematics? You say that y is a function of, say, three other variables. Like this could be the price of a car, this could be the age, this could be the mileage, and this could be the, the price when new. And you, you describe some kind of function that, given this input, tells you the price. Okay. Um, so some functional form we need, but the, the common thing is to use a linear form. So then we need, that would be something like this. This is the simplest we can do. So I'm saying that the price is a linear function of these three input parameters. Now I'm specifying a, a model. And then we need this functional form. It needs to be actually parametric. I mean, I'm talking very general and broadly now, so you don't have to sort of think too hard about this now. But what we are going to do is, of course, to observe a lot of cars that were sold. We will observe the prices. We will observe the, the values of different variables here. And then we will try to understand this relation. Hmm? So we're going to need a concrete function here in the end. We need numbers for these guys. So that's why we need a parametric uh, expression. This is one thing. And the second thing is all of us know probably that uh, for this model, even though I know perfectly this car is tel 10 years old, it's gone 150,000 kilometers, and it costed 300,000 kroner when it was new, <coughs> there's no way I'm going to tell exactly what the selling price is going to be. Okay? So there's something more to this relation here. There's something important which we can call randomness. Or we can call it, it's very often called error. Um, yeah. So 
this is a simple, or maybe it doesn't look that simple, but it's a model anyway to, that describes how the price depends on three other variables, and then there is some kind of additional random factor to the price. So just to address this uh, randomness thing that we see, you, we, uh, we have seen this relation here. This is the transport company. The x is the trip distance. And the y is the duration of the trips in, in minutes, I guess. Um, so clearly, these two variables are highly related. They are correlated. So there's a positive correlation. So you could probably model it like y is a linear function of x. But there is something more here. Because if you say just this, you're saying if I know the, the distance, I could predict the duration perfectly. So this model does not capture the fact that, which I see in my data, for instance, 10 kilometer trips, they have a fair variation of durations. So there's a clear trend here, but there is also randomness. Right. So briefly stated, as we will see, we will model the randomness as just another variable coming in here. Hmm? So I'm saying that the duration is a linear function of the distance, but there is some uncontrollable additional disturbance to it. So what we are going to do in the chapter 4 here is to learn how to uh, obtain what we call the linear, the estimated linear model. So it's represented by this line here. So this is supposed to give us the best, uh, the best expression for this part of the model. So there will be some specific numbers here that will be the best sort of fit to this data. And then we will also have some means of estimating the size of randomness into the picture. OK. Yeah. So we are going to start in chapter 4, or all of chapter 4 is actually going to look at models with only one x variable and one y variable. So we're going to work on this kind of model. But later on, we will go to more hairy things like, like this one, which is a three variable regression model. And then the question is, you can, of course, put up the theoretical model and say, I believe that this is linear and so on. But there's also the question, how do we come down to uh, estimates for these parameters? Here? So an estimated model, in this case, we would have from data some particular numeric values for these. Uh, parameters. So this number here, minus 64.7, it will be an estimate for this coefficient here. And we will learn that it represents something very particular in the model. It's the marginal effect of the variable x2 on y. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, now it's quite um, 
abstract, but the marginal effect here means that if you increase x2 here in the, in the model, if you increase this by one unit, then the model estimates that the y variable changes by this amount. So it could be the marginal effect of age on a, on a used car, for instance, would be how much does one extra year subtract on the price of the car, right? Or if you measure the di driven distance in 1,000 kilometers, how much does 1,000 extra kilometers uh, subtract to the price? We expect something negative, right? Um, so these are marginal effects, and we'll, we'll talk about that next week. Uh, or the week after. So there are uh, sort of two very heavy motivations for using regression models. Um, the first one is the sort of scientific uh, piece. It's to increase the understanding of relationships between variables, mainly Much of science, medical science, and other sciences is more or less to understand how different effects and variables um, are interrelated. And that is very often a relationship between random variables. For the, the car example here, it would be more like uh, some economists would like to understand the, the price formation in the, the, in the in the car market, second-hand car market. And you note the parameter estimates, they are very important because they are namely those who tell us how, so this beta 2 here, it tells us exactly how strongly x2 impacts this one, right? And the second basic use of regression model is in planning and forecasting and so on in a very simplistic uh, example with the cars here. If you have a good model, you could use it to help you come up with a price prediction. So you want to, if you can have good price predictions in the market, it could help you to make good deals, right? Um, so you put in this, you have this very nice estimated model with very good uh, pre prediction quality. Then you just put in for this new car, it's never been sold as a used car, but it's a 2008 Toyota Avensis. It's gone this far. It has this kind of engine and so on. And you want to guess the price. Yeah, you can put this into your model and get uh, an estimate of the price. So this is, we're going to, to work on both of these sides of the, oh, <laughs> sign from <laughs> the guy above. Well, <laughs> um, I can, uh, I can tell you there was ju just one sentence uh, uh, left on the slide, and it's just summarizing more or less. Um, it says, a major activity in applied and theoretical science is to estimate and test <laughs> hypotheses about regression models. OK, so let's stop there um, and start this in detail next week.